Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg. Our program on Cascade Volcanoes will begin at 6 p.m. local time. Welcome to the backyard. Hope you're doing well. I see a bunch of you are there already. That's kind of cool. Hello, 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 hello. Check my laptop and we can uh, visit for a couple minutes. Well, how's everything on your end? We've, we've done a number of these. Well, how's everything on your end? So, you know, practice makes perfect. I remember a week ago I was scrambling and unsure and is the, how's the video? How's the audio? I think we got all that nailed. I think, I think we figured a bunch of that out. And I say we, cause you've been very helpful with that. So it feels like technology-wise, things are under control, at least for the, for the time being. Now I jinxed it, of course, and then we'll have trouble tonight, but I hope not. We've had uh, every kind of a weather situation you can imaginable today. What? We've had a lot of different kinds of weather today. We had some hail for a while. Had a little bit of snow for a while, had a little bit of steady rain. So, I think the old chalkboard's hanging in there. Unclear if there'll be a little moisture, but we can handle that. Oroville, California. Wish I knew where that was. Sounds like a pleasant place. Cricket River Caldera. Burlington, Washington, I presume. It's been so fun to see the regulars, but also new places every night. In other words, new people checking in and joining us. Of course, you can watch these as replays, but um, I suppose it's a different experience if you're here live with this. Hello, Scott. Orville's just south and a bit east of Chico, southwest of Lawson, or Lassen. Yeah, I'll have a disclaimer at the beginning of this one, I'm afraid. <laughs> I try not to do that, but oh, what the hell, I'll say it now. I picked the topic tonight, Cascade Volcano. No, I'll save it, I'll save it. South Bend, Indiana again. Hello, Ruth. Tom Water, Carlson's. Hope you guys are doing okay. Sorry to hear the news.
How's the framing? Can you see the very bottom of this chalkboard? Can you see the, the bottom, the bottom edge? I'm always a little surprised when I watch a replay and I can see more. Not the bottom right. Well, that's okay, but you can see that. You can see this bottom. I'll probably do a few things right down here. You can see that okay? Great. Okay. Thanks. Well, it feels like I should uh, show you the schedule for the rest of the week, just in case. We will continue with talking about cascades tomorrow. Something called ghost volcanoes. And then offshore of Washington and Oregon for great earthquakes. And then in the Columbia River Gorge. So pretty Northwest specific. Again, another programming note, we'll have a different time on Saturday and Sunday. Just switching it up a little bit. There'll be some reminders about that. I'm having a good time with these. I hope you're enjoying them. I'm particularly loose tonight. I I don't know what I'm I don't know what I'm going to do here. I got a whole bunch of stuff, but I have we'll just we'll just uh, wait for the spirit to move us. Got to stop eating pastries. I'm uh, getting big. I'm going to risk it. I'm going to take this raincoat off. Yeah, Justin, that's right. Trying to exercise, it's just, mm. All right, we got about a minute. Let me get my thoughts together and we'll get started. Well, thanks for dropping in tonight, everybody. Welcome. It's great to have you with us. It's six o'clock local time. Let's get into it. We're going to talk tonight about Cascades Volcanoes. 
and maybe you're here very specifically to hear about your favorite cone, your favorite stratovolcano in the Cascades. Well, I live in Washington. And even though we'll talk about the Cascades for a while as an entire mountain range, I'm really going to be talking about Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens tonight. Maybe you guessed that already. So if you tuned in specifically to hear about Bachelor or Medicine Lake Volcano or a ton about Shasta or Lassen Peak, I guess I'm not your guy. Uh, mostly because I don't know much about what's going on that far south. But I have some very specific things about Washington and some of the things I'd like to cover tonight, if I can remember, I've got a bunch of things to use here, things that I brought in from school this afternoon. Um, I'd like to talk about the events leading up to Mount St. Helens, and I've got a few things that I think you'll enjoy, I hope you'll enjoy. I'd like to talk about an event that happened in South Puget Sound, near Seattle, Washington, that was a transformative event, and the geologist who kind of figured that out on his own. And I'd like, I've got some rock samples. I've got some Mount St. Helens ash to share with you. I've got just kind of a roll call of geologic or uh, I guess eruptions in the Cascades since the USA began in 1776. So that's what I got up my sleeve tonight. And uh, if I forget to show you some of that before we get to the Q&A, which will be happening in a half an hour-ish, um, you, you can remind me and that, that'll, that'll help, me, help me out. You know, normally in the classroom, I'm not much of a prop person because I've got all these visuals and animations, but this is a different gig. I mean, this is not the podcast that I do. That's totally audio. It's not the PBS stuff or some of the other visual heavy things. It's in this weird kind of sweet spot or sour spot between uh, audio only and just visual onslaught. So I've got to bring in specific things to show you and hopefully it works for you. So, we have viewers from around the world. Let's do a quick geography lesson. And kids, kids, you're here, and do you know where the Cascade Volcanoes are? So, we go to the whiteboard right off the bat. We're going to use the chalkboard a fair amount. So, here's Washington, and here's Oregon, and here's Northern California, Redding, Portland, Seattle, Spokane, Vancouver, up in B.C. And this looks like a, a bunch of peas in a pea pod, doesn't it? But I used red because those are volcanoes. That's red hot lava, magma, that's coming up in those particular spots. And I chose circles here because we have cones. So these are not the circles of last time, which were the big super volcano calderas. Instead, these are cones. Cones that look like this. So we have those cascade volcanoes all strung out in a line like that because we have an ocean plate that's subducting or diving beneath the leading edge of North America. It's called the Juan de Fuca plate. It's a tiny plate. It's a, it's a baby. It's a baby tectonic plate. And yet it's still a headache to us. The subduction of that Juan de Fuca plate has created lots of trauma for residents in the Pacific Northwest going back thousands of years. Yes, I'm talking about Native Americans as well as the white folks who showed up in the last couple hundred years. And it will continue to provide headaches for us, although we don't want to dwell on that tonight. We've got enough headaches going on right now. But uh, this is an issue of volcanic hazards, and we can get there if you want a little bit. Okay, so as long as we have the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate, we're going to have these volcanoes strung on in a line. Tomorrow night, I want to go back in geologic history and talk about 40 million years worth of Cascade eruptions, but that's not tonight. Tonight is just looking at recent eruptions in the Cascades, and by recent, I mean really just in the last couple of hundred years, and what we know and what we don't know about the future as well. Okay, so specifically in Washington, where I live, this is my backyard here in Ellensburg, uh, going from north to south in Washington, we have five of these cones. And each of them have, a, in our mind, an equal chance of erupting. Although we can look into a statement like that. But we have no way to look into the future and say, Mount Adams is more likely to erupt than Mount Rainier, or Mount St. Helens, or Glacier Peak, or Mount Baker. Or we can go up to BC and go to Garibaldi and a few of those vents. Or we can go to Hood, or Three Sisters or Jefferson, or Bachelor, or Medicine Lake, or this is Mazama, which is better known as Crater Lake National Park. 
or Shasta or Lassen. Okay, so collectively, there are some things we know tectonically, and we, there's some, we are monitoring all of these cones very carefully. By we, you know, I'm a teacher. I don't do any of the research. But there's Cascade Volcano Observer, Observatory geologists who are assigned to each of these cones. And they're, they're, each of those cones, each of those volcanoes is active, meaning that it has red-hot magma inside of it. It's not a dead system. And the geologists, that's their job, is to monitor these mountains and to carefully monitor tiny earthquakes, indicating magma movement, uh, to monitor gases coming out, to monitor the slopes or the bulge of the mountain, uh, gases, uh, chemistries in the lakes nearby, etc. Okay, so uh, if we're looking for comfort, to comfort tonight, and I, I think many of us are looking for comfort on an hourly basis, I can only speak for myself, these cones, and we are going to talk about some drama tonight in the Cascades, these cones usually have weeks and weeks and weeks of buildup, small activity, before a potentially lethal explosion or a blast. In fact, let's go to that. I'm working on a new lecture that I was going to give downtown and record for YouTube, but that'll wait till the fall. Uh, so I, I found one of my slides that I put together and I just kind of wrote, wrote it out with my Sharpies here at the kitchen table 20 minutes ago. So I got some breeze here. So here's the list that I've put together from various sources of Cascade volcanic activity, eruptions in the Cascades, since our country was born, since 1776. And you can see the name of the volcano in the middle. You can see the date or the age range that the cones did their thing. But I think it's also important uh, to realize that each time we talk about one of these volcanoes erupting, it's not the same experience. And so this is the uh, homespun categorization that I put together 20 minutes ago. Uh, my blast is self-explanatory. We're going to talk about Mount St. Helens 1980 in just a bit, and 57 people were killed, and there was a lethal blast, and there was all sorts of drama and, and sadness. Um, but these other cones, with these other dates, you can see where it doesn't say blast, it says what? Well, minor. Minor to me, and I, these are just obviously just kind of subjective terms, minor is obvious activity, but nobody's getting killed. Like you can stand uh, uh, 10 miles away and you can see these big ash plumes and you can see maybe some glowing at night or something, but it's not a catastrophic blast killing people for these things I'm, I'm using in green. And then the puffs, I mean, that's, talk about scientific, good Lord. You've got to go back to Vinman's for a cream puff. The puffs are, are truly that, just a little, little, little puff of steam, you know. Oftentimes in, in the newspaper accounts, there's people that swore that there was a, uh, in a you know, a, the mountain's waking up, and then it turns out it was just some low clouds. Or, you know, so there's, there's a lot of kind of unreliable, unconfirmed sources, including Rainier and some others. And so this is just a, a general feeling to give us a sense of how active things have been. And of course, the headline is St. Helens has had three big blast events with geologic evidence, with actual deposits. And in the case of the mid-1800s, with some white folks in uh, painting, making paintings. Paul Kane, another guy I can't remember, and confirmed with some Native Americans living in eastern Washington and, and having very specific stories about those specific blasts. So uh, that's, that's a kind of an anthropology, archaeology intersection with geology that I find fascinating. Okay. You want to see some rocks? You want to see some ash? Kids, I'm glad you're with us tonight. Uh, yeah. Let me show you some Mount St. Helens ash. No, I'm not going to do it yet. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to uh, tease you like that. I want to do something on the board first, and then we'll look at some of these things, okay? So... When we say a mountain erupts and it blasts or there's kind of clouds, 
What specifically are we talking about? What's happening with these cones? And again, each of these Cascade volcanoes has a typical cone shape. They're just as perfect as can be. So what I'd like to do here, yep, what I'd like to do here is uh, have a, take your pick, take your favorite volcano in the Cascades, and I'm going to look from the side, and I'm also going to look on that same volcano down below, or down from above. So this is a map, and this is a cross section. In geology, we typically are doing that. We're drawing maps and we're drawing cross sections. Side views are the same thing. And uh, those that are particularly gifted can draw block diagrams where you actually take the map and you take the cross section and you make a kind of a three-dimensional thing. That's not me. So, gosh, I should write this out. I told you I was going to be a little scattered tonight. Our main lesson before we go to my rocks and, and we've got go to my uh, old newspapers that I found is when these cones erupt in the Cascades, and this really works for any cone around the world, there are four distinctly different things that are happening. We can call them volcanic products, but that's not a super satisfying heading for this list of four. But here we go. And I'm going to draw them on the chalkboard. Ash, fall, terrible marker, ash, flow, lava, flow, Mud flow. These are four different things. Some of them far more dangerous than others. And in the case of Mount St. Helens in 1980, all four of these things were happening at the same time. And that's common for many stratovolcanoes or composite cone volcano eruptions. So let's look carefully at each of those and keeping the pace up. I'm talking to myself now. I don't want to get too hung up on this because I got the show and tell. And of course, we're getting to your questions um, momentarily. So I guess I'll go back and forth. So ash fall. What's that? Well, even kids, I think you've seen a picture of an erupting cone volcano. There's this huge plume like cauliflower, this, this big rising plume of gray ash. And there's usually a prevailing wind at the time. And so that ash gets blown downwind of the erupting column. And then the ash falls out of the sky and lands on the ground. Pretty descriptive, wouldn't you say? So ash fall is truly ash falling out of the sky, like the snow that we had this morning. But it's not snow, it's ash. And in the case of a map view of the same thing, assuming we have winds blowing from west to east, it's only the towns that are due east at our latitude, if we have prevailing winds coming out of the west, it's only these towns due east of the mountain that are gonna receive the ash. And that's Ellensburg. When Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, we got enough ash in this valley to block out the sun. It was pitch black at noon here in Ellensburg on May 18, 1980, because there was so much ash that was between the sun and our little town. And you can still find about a quarter inch of that fine volcanic ash uh, in our valley. Let's go to the ash. I got I got I got to enunciate now. Let's go to the ash. So I've had this on the top shelf of my office for 30 years. I was not here in Ellensburg when Mount St. Helens erupted. I was graduating from high school back in Wisconsin. But this thing's not I've never used it. So I feel great that I can finally use 
this coffee can. This is a vintage coffee can. Albertsons is a grocery chain out here that still exists, kind of, I guess. Electric Perk Coffee. And this is ash from Mount St. Helens that was collected on the roof of the geology building on campus, probably by Jack Powell, who's a geologist that was here before I was. Uh, let me show you some of this. Have you seen volcanic ash before? What is volcanic ash? Well, let's look at it first. So here's an empty pie pan, uh, tin, and here's a little bit of, I don't really know what I'm gonna do here, by the way. So it's, it's gritty. It's not like kitchen flour, like it, it, I can't really crush the individual grains. It's kind of a fine sand. And the sun is trying to come through. In fact, I think we are gonna get some sun, believe it or not. Wow, that's kind of a surprise. And if I remember, I might come back and show you this when the sun comes out, if it does, because there's little minerals here. There's, this is, ash is basically rock that's blown up. Like, I used to watch cartoons. I don't know about you. I used to love cartoons. Wile E. Coyote and that kind of stuff. And what do you do on those, some of those Looney Tunes shows? Well, you take a big piece of rhyolite. That's what this is. That's a lava rock that's sometimes found in, in the, the Cascades. And you take big sticks of dynamite. You know, you're trying to catch the roadrunner. So you put, you know, drill a hole in the rhyolite, you put a big stick of dynamite in, you light the fuse, and let's say it actually works instead of being Wiley e. Coyote. And you take this rock and you kaboom it down to I'm chintzy with this ash. Come on, I haven't used it. Let's let's live it up. Let's have an ash party. Give me some of that ash. All right, so volcanic ash is just lava rock that's blown to smithereens, but the minerals here and the minerals here are the same stuff. Same stuff. And this is the stuff that got blown downwind and landed. More coming on that in a second. Gotta pick up the pace, gotta pick up the pace, gotta pick up the pace. Ash flow, bad news. Nobody's getting killed with ash fall. It's a nuisance. It's getting into carburetors. People are very anxious. They don't know what's happening. These cones don't erupt that often. But the ash flows, sometimes called pyroclastic flows, number two, it's tough to survive that. So generally, in a cross-sectional view, number two, the ash flows or pyroclastic flows are these traveling clouds of gas, ash, rock, trees, logging trucks, whatever this whirling dervish, this Tasmanian devil, to keep going with the theme, uh, covering the ground. A ground-hugging white-hot cloud that has so much energy that it doesn't care what the topography is. If there's a ridge ahead, the pyroclastic flow is going up and over that ridge. It's bad stuff. And whether it's a lateral blast or a kind of a momentum thing coming down the slopes of the mountain, uh, ash flows are not good. So number two, these ash flows can go any direction. Difficult to predict the direction that the ash flows are going to surge away. We have hardly any video of what those pyroclastic flows look like because you can't survive them. You can't set up your tripod and get a camera going and then outrace this thing. Bad, bad, bad. Too bad to even think about. Let's move on. Number three was what? We got some sun. Can't believe it. Oh, yeah. Don't know if it's going to work. I hope 
possibly some of you can see little glittering diamonds. They're not diamonds, but they're sparkly minerals that are sparkly minerals that were sparkly minerals in the lava rock and are still sparkly minerals. This is actual Mount St. Helens ash that fell here in Ellensburg, Washington. And there's a lot of it depending on where you dig. Achoo! Number three, lava flows. The main message is lava flows are not a big concern with residents of a large area surrounding a Cascade volcano because lava flows here, the lava flows are so sticky with these kinds of volcanoes that they don't travel very far. Some of you have been to Mount Rainier National Park. It's just a couple hour drive from here and we feel very lucky to be so close to such a beautiful place. Those lava flows that erupted from Mount Rainier never left the National Park. There's no concern about lava flows traveling tens and hundreds of miles. It's impossible with the kinds of lavas that are coming out of these cones. Those are andesite lavas. Let me show you a good, a good looking cascade andesite especially since the sun is out now. So this is a lava rock that you haven't seen before in this little series. It's called Andesite, named after the Andes Mountains in South America. And the key to knowing that you're looking at Andesite is do you see some black minerals that are shiny and kind of long and thin? That's a mineral called Hornblende. And that's a dead giveaway that you're looking at an andesite lava rock. And this is the mineralogy or the, the, the crystal chemistry of these lava flows. So in other words, this isn't basalt. This isn't the German chocolate cake and all that. We're, we're on to a totally different kind of a volcanic story here. Yeah, this camera's working well tonight, I think. How far, I'm getting greedy. How far can I get in? gets blurry at some point, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, the last one, we're back to bad news. So I'm saying we're not really worried about people being hurt from number one and number three, for the most part. Number two, that's a very big concern, and, and we want to make sure we know what's going on with mitigating something like that. Number four is a sneaky one, a volcanic mud flow or something called a lahar. That's an Indonesian word, a lahar. Let me show you what one those looks like. So here's the andesite lava that I just showed you that doesn't flow very far. Let's say less than 10 miles. But this, which probably looks very similar to you, is volcanic mud flow. And this is from a lahar or a volcanic mud flow that traveled 60 miles away from the volcano. And you're like, okay, well, I don't even think I know what you're talking about. Well, we're talking about number four now, a, a mud flow. The idea is When you have a volcanic mountain, like in the Cascades, take your pick, and it starts to become active, it's possible, maybe even common, depending on which mountain you're talking about, to have a whole portion, geologists call it a sector, one sector or one section of the mountain becomes particularly unstable. And like in a bad movie, like in a bad dream, at a particular moment, a whole portion of that mountain starts to move, starts to break away. And the initial action is a big landslide. So that part of the mountain is now here. I need an animation now. And now that part of the mountain has slid down to the base. And there's so much water and ice and snow in the mountain that it's not just a big part of the mountain that just slumps to the base of the mountain, 
that landslide actually converts into a volcanic mud flow, like this big vanilla milkshake that's going to head down this neighboring river valley, or liquid concrete. Have you seen concrete come out of a cement mixer? That's kind of the consistency and the strength of a volcanic mud flow or a lahar. And the reason this is a problem is I'm going to draw on this map from, let's say, Mount Rainier, where a volcanic mud flow traveled. I just went 60 miles away from the mountain in a, in a town that you'd never dream would, would be in danger of a volcano. It's 60 miles away from the cone. And yet, that town is built on a volcanic mud flow from the past activity with the mountain. So educating the public about the dangers of these lahars is a big deal, especially because these lahars follow river valleys. Unlike the pyroclastic flows that kind of went up and over, these volcanic mud flows follow river valleys, and the bad news is all the roads in a mountainous area, all the dream homes, etc., are along the river. They're Basically, all the people are living in the path that these volcanic mud flows are going to follow. So, how can I prove to you that this is a volcanic mud flow? Well, there's a key thing that's in this rock. Uh, I don't know how the focus is working tonight. Hopefully, pretty well. Maybe you can get a sense as you look at this lahar or volcanic mud flow that there's some white. Here's some white patches here. And now, let me take this this key my office key, and let me show you something. I don't know if you can see this or not, but this stuff's very soft. Can you see little parts of this flying through the air like in the shadow of my forehead? Or it's falling on my fingers here. This is the, the key that this is a, a slurry of stuff that came quickly down a river valley and landed close by in the form of a volcanic mud flow. This is a rock called pumice, and pumice is very fragile. I can see between me and the camera, uh, it's like it's snowing here. This is a 10 million year old lahar, by the way, so these are little fragments of pumice that I'm setting free for, for the first time in 10 million years. I suppose they're happy right now. So pumice is, is, is a deposit that comes directly from the volcano itself, and yet here it is 60 miles away from the mountain, and those pumice clasts didn't get crushed, didn't get broken down. So everything came down as a unit and then settled out. Kids especially, but I guess fans of all ages, let's talk about pumice. So I have my drink tonight, and there's ice cubes, and these, what are these in here? That's... These are olives, right? Okay, now. Here's the basalt that I showed you last night from the big island of Hawaii. Do you remember? It's even got a bunch of holes in it. It's not pumice. Okay, that, that went to the bottom. Here's from the Ancient Rivers Lecture. We have a rhyolite from the Seven Devils Mountains of Idaho brought to Washington by the Salmon River. I wonder if this will float. That's a negative. Here are some beautiful obsidian, which is often found in the Cascades. Volcanic glass, maybe a topic for another night. What am I doing? What was I talking about? I was talking about pumice. Do you know about pumice and water? Here's a big block of pumice that's mostly airspace. There's more open space than there is rock in pumice. It's like magma that's frothed up into this foam near the volcanic vent. Shall we try it? 
I hope it works. I hope it floats. Just like two of my olives and my ice cubes are floating, let's see if the pumice floats. Hey, it worked. Um, here's to you. Hmm, cascades. Here's to you, Brogan. Okay, good. A little more show and tell. I can't remember who gave me this, but thank you for doing it. Somebody collected some of the Lava Dome in Mount St. Helens in 1982, plus or minus. And it's a good looking rhyolite. So this is a rock that's, um, what, 38 years old. Younger than me, older than you, perhaps. Or maybe a lot younger than you. So my point is we have four different phenomena happening with Cascade Volcanoes. What were they? Ash fall, ash flow, lava flow, mud flow. Good. Oftentimes happening at the same time. And we have different kinds of rocks. We can have basalt erupting, andesite erupting, rhyolite erupting. We've got all sorts of different phenomena happening geologically up there as well. And the next time we have an eruption of a Cascade Volcano, or if we think back to the last time we had an eruption of a Cascade Volcano, all four of these events or phenomena and many different kinds of rocks are all being created with that one particular event. It's a complicated set of ideas. I'm kind of more setting up your questions than normal because I know you'll have a bunch of volcano questions and I, I just want to give you a broad range of ideas here. Now the sun is still strong and I want to try to comfort you a little bit if possible and give you a sense, I don't know, maybe this isn't comfort now that I think about it, I want to give you a sense with these old newspapers that have also been on my shelf since I moved here in 1992, and I'm happy to start using them. So, uh, where's that list? So I'd like to zero in on Mount St. Helens, the big blast, and if you're a young person, you're unfamiliar with this, I guess. There was a tremendous eruption of a volcano in southern Washington called Mount St. Helens, it erupted on Sunday morning, May 18th, 1980, at uh, 8.32 in the morning. And we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of that tragic morning. The good news I'm trying to pass along is that that mountain woke up in March. The big blast, the big blast where 57 people were killed on that Sunday morning was on May 18th, and I'm telling you that two months before that, in mid-March, there was action. In other words, this is not like earthquakes where you have no warning and then kabam. These mountains, these cone volcanoes, have patterns of small activity. So literally yellowed pages here. These are actual, I don't know who collected these in our geology department back in 1980. Uh, but this is from the Seattle Post Intelligencer, uh, a paper that no longer exists, but it was the voice of the Northwest since 1863. That's sad. Uh, Mount St. Helens erupts. Now, this is not the big event. This is just the beginning of the summit area forming a little bit of a crater. And they start uh, um, interviewing geologists, just a few geologists who happen to be in the area. There was no Cascade Volcano Observatory yet. There were just a few United States Geological Survey geologists who were in the area taking some crude measurements. Let me read you just a couple things here. Mount St. Helens erupted from 123 years of peaceful slumber. This is on March of 1980, two months before the eruption. Uh, just after noon yesterday with a volcanic upheaval that ripped a new crater in the mountain's top. Skipping down. This is sad. I hope I don't cry now. Volcano expert David Johnston 
said the mountain technically had not erupted yesterday when it belched up clouds of ash and steam. This is a steam explosion, a series of them, Johnston said. Johnston told reporters who were allowed up to the 4,000 foot level of the mountain last night. An explosion could come in 10 minutes or three months, Johnston said. If there is an explosion, all sorts of stuff will start to come down. Well, David was one of the people that died in May 18th. And there's a whole story involving David. Um, let's move on. Uh, Johnson was countered last night by Dr. Donald Molino. So we'll talk, a, a, before we go to your questions and answers, uh, your questions and my answers, we'll talk about Molino and Crandall here for just a bit. Uh, Molino, chief volcanologist for the USGS, who claimed that the glow observed on the mountaintop was an effect created by infrared photography. He said, however, that infrared photos showed six active hotspots in the growing crater. By nine last night, the crater was reported to be 300 feet long and 250 feet wide and 150 feet deep. And he went on to say that um, uh, we just don't know what's going to happen. But that doesn't stop the reporters from showing big spreads of this new crater. You can imagine that this mountain, which people had been vacationing under, there's family homes, family cabins, and then this thing is just kind of rumbling to life. Like, is this thing, is this thing really a volcano? I can't believe it. Also in late March, this is the Oregonian. St. Helens spews blocks of ice. So I don't need to go through all these papers with you, but I can give you a sense that there was coverage of these quote unquote minor events, minor meaning nobody was killed yet. Minor was the events leading up to Mount St. Helens. And then here's the day after May 18th. This is the Yakima newspaper, Monday, May 19th. She blows. Souvenir, special edition, ash covers Yakima Valley. And Yakima, as well as Ellensburg, were the uh, two of the communities just downwind. There's a color map, pretty sexy diagram for a newspaper in 1980. And Mount St. Helens is here. And that orange arrow is not lava. It's one of our four things. It's number one, it's the ash fall that was kind of sent to the Northeast. And many of you know that many of the towns in Eastern Washington received varying amounts of ash. Surprisingly, there was more ash that fell over by Ritzville than fell in uh, Ellensburg. So each town was a little bit different. Absolutely crazy, cautious drivers, uh, agricultural impacts, the whole bit. Well, of course, this just wasn't st story was within the Pacific Northwest. This is a national story. Kids, this used to be a big thing. Most of us read a magazine that would come to your house every week. It's called Time Magazine. And so President Carter is flying in in a helicopter. There's coverage. There's actually a, a very grisly photo here that I'm not going to show you. I will show you this one, though. Here's a, a car. Look at that old car in Ellensburg in uh, 1980 uh, with a bunch of uh, fine ash on top of it. I want to finish my part of this program with uh, a quick um, memory uh, of Dwight Rocky Crandall. So we're switching to Mount Rainier now, just before we go to your questions. And Mount Rainier has been studied just as much as Mount St. Helens. I'm talking about pre-1980 now, and there were all sorts of publications that came out, all sorts of interesting studies, mainly by just a few people. Crandall and Molino were two of the best. And I've made friends with Rocky Crandall's daughter, Jane. Uh, she made contact with me and said, I'd like to share some of my dad's um, personal belongings so that you can kind of understand more about him. And so she made a copy of Dwight Rocky Crandall's field notes from 1953, where he drew a light bulb in his notebook 
and he was doing a geologic map in the Puyallup, Ording, Buckley, Carbondale area. And his idea was, he thought he was mapping glacial deposits from the ice sheet that came down from Canada. But he was seeing a bunch of stuff in the South Puget Sound that didn't make any sense to him. And his idea was, I wonder if this is a big number four. He didn't call it that. I wonder if this is a big volcanic mud flow that came down from Mount Rainier. And uh, Jane also made a copy of a publication that Rand, uh, Crandall and Molino uh, published in 1978, two years before 19, 1980. And you can see all the geologists who were friends and colleagues and contributors to this report, uh, including David Johnston. And something I haven't done with you before, but I'm going to try to do, I want to read one paragraph from that 1978 report written by Crandall and Molyneux, talking about this is 1978, by a geology report now. Predicting the next eruption of Mount St. Helens, 1978. The present dormant state of Mount St. Helens began in 1856, and no way is now known of determining when the volcano will erupt again. Mount St. Helens' behavior pattern during the last 4,500 years has been one of the spasmodic periods of activity, separated by five or six dormant intervals of a little more than two to about five centuries duration. In addition, 12 dormant periods of one or two centuries in length have been identified, and many intervals of a few years or a few decades surely occurred during prolonged periods of intermittent eruptive activity. The Mount St. Helen volcano behavior pattern suggests that the current quiet interval will not last as long as a thousand years. Instead, an eruption is more likely to occur within the next 100 years, and perhaps even before the end of this century, the 20th century. So you might go, well, that was kind of vague. They said about everything there. Well, you can only say things based on the evidence that you have. And you see what they were doing. They were looking at the deposits that they'd been able to work with, get the ages of those, talk about the average number of quiet years between events, and try to say something about the future. In his last sentence, possibly Mount St. Helens erupting before the year 2000 turned out to be right. Uh, hang with me. I got two more things I want to show you. So you haven't seen this, this is on display all over the place at the USGS website. If you go to the Cascade Volcano Observatory website, you can see just the last 4,000 years, much longer than I'm talking about tonight, right? I'm just talking about the last 200 years. But this is pretty much the main message of what we know from our studies of deposits so far of all of our volcanoes in the, in the Cascades and what we know about their activity in the last 4,000 years. Switching to Mount Rainier and Dwight Crandall with the light bulb and the idea of a lahar coming from Mount Rainier, we now know that Mount Rainier is poised to erupt again. I wish we could say likelihood of such and such within the next few years. We cannot. But what you're looking at is an area that not only has yellow areas where volcanic mud flows are possible, but uh, the, the arrows here, estimated lahar travel time in hours after an eruption. So seven tenths of an hour. And they're, they're showing you how much time folks would have to evacuate out of the valley at a particular spot once we get word that Rainier has, a sector of Rainier has collapsed and a lahar is coming down 
that particular uh, valley. I lied two more things than I, prob I promised to shut up. This is in living color what I was trying to show you on the chalkboard, where we have all these different phenomenon. Do some of them look familiar to you now from our discussion? Or maybe you knew about them before? There's some things on here we did not talk about. But I was trying to give you a sense of all those possibilities. And any generic stratovolcano around the world, could be Fuji, could be any cone in the Andes, etc., have all of these possibilities. The last thing is going back to Cynthia Shaw's, Cynthia Shaw Cooper, I still don't know your name, I'm sorry. We looked at this last night and we're focusing in now on all of that magma coming up from the subducting Juan de Fuca plate and feeding these cascade volcanoes. It's quite a system and it's right here. It's not out in some wilderness area. It's right here. We cross Snoqualmie. We go on US-12. We go, it's right here, these cones. And millions of people have arrived since the last time we had major volcanic activity. It's a new record. I went 46 minutes that time. Uh, we almost have 500 people. That's great. Let's go ahead and start the q and I'll try to keep it going as fast as I can. Uh, uppercase, please, if you're new to us. And I'll, especially if you're kids, I'll try to, I'll try very hard to get to your question. You know that I can't promise that, but I'm going to try. Here we go. On average, how often is there a major event in the Cascades? Very difficult, primarily because it's a work in progress to inventory the deposits that we know. So think of each of these volcanoes as having dozens and dozens of volcanic deposits. One, two, three, four, maybe all of them, you know, are, are volcanic. And we haven't had enough people and enough time to get dates for all of those things. Until we kind of, until we eventually get a sense of amount of volcanic material produced by past eruptions and dates on those things, I can't give you a reasonable answer. I'm sorry. I guess you're going to hear that a lot from me tonight. I got to be careful with some of what I say. It's dangerous to forecast in general because you often don't have nearly the information you need to be reasonable and intelligent with your forecast. We all want to forecast. We all want to be prepared, but I'm not an emergency official, I, 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 so I'm going to be restrained a little bit tonight. I didn't see Mount McLaughlin in Oregon on your whiteboard map. Is it considered inactive? Uh, I am ignorant that far south in Oregon, and I've had many people bring up Mount McLaughlin before. I need to learn. I need to get up to speed. Um, I don't know if it's active or not. I'm sorry. What do you know about the Coldwater Ridge Fault? Not much, Tim. Oh my God, uh, this is a terrible live Q&A so far. I haven't given one reasonable answer. Um, there's probably a fault there. I don't know much about it. That's near, near um, um, St. Helens. Is the boring lava field part of the Cascade story? You might think that's a joke, but it's not. There's a little town called Boring, Oregon, which is in the east suburbs of Portland. And there's hundreds of cinder cone volcanoes that are at Boring, stretching up towards Goldendale, Washington, going up towards um, Longview, Kelso, going down into central Oregon. Do you know what cinder cones are? Uh, they're, they're much smaller mountains than these cones we're talking about, but there's these little cones, and they're often made of cinders, these kind of basaltic, uh, like little kernels of popcorn just piled up. Um, the short answer is they're not. They're found in the Cascades, but they're, they're all basaltic and they're all ice age in, in, in activity. And so I split them out and I'm going to do a lecture on the boring volcanoes or just kind of these ice age volcanic vents. Uh, but I think it's more tied to faults and magma coming up there. So you can kind of lump it with the Cascades, but I, 
it doesn't fit at all with what we were talking about tonight, is my point. Uh, Patrick, hello. What did Mo Why did more ash fall farther away in Ritzville than in Ellensburg? Yeah, I kind of wonder that myself. It's more of a, a physics question involving airflow. And without thinking about it, you would assume, and maybe you are thinking that too, Patrick, that wouldn't you have a lot of ash falling right next to the mountain and then it gets less and less ash falling out of the sky as you get into Montana? And in general, that's true. But there's all sorts of wind patterns and other things happening within this prevailing wind to allow things to drop out at certain places. That's about as specific as I can get, which means I don't really know what I'm talking about. Uh, how does Mount the uh, Thielson near Diamond Lake, north of uh, Crater Lake, a glacially eroded shield volcano fit into this picture. I don't know, Marin, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, should put, I should record that and just, just hit play. Um, not only do we have cones in the Cascades, Not only do we have these obvious, beautiful, majestic scoops of vanilla ice cream on the horizon known as stratovolcanoes, there's also shield volcanoes. Newberry Volcano has got about every different kind of volcanic activity you can imagine in one system. Much of that has not been figured out. And there are some Oregon volcanologists who are really doing some nice work and I'm continuing to try to learn from them. Um, so all I can say is that with the present cones that we have, the stratovolcanoes, we've got good, well-behaved magma systems that are generally producing one kind of magma. But even that's not totally accurate. You get some basaltic things coming up. St. Helens made a little bit of basalt 2,000 years ago, and that's Ape Cave. Uh, so there's complexity there, some of which nobody knows how to explain, but part of it is me needing to read more. Why do some of these... God. People were telling me to use one finger, but... Why are some of these volcanoes more active than others? Don't know, Eric. St. Helens has been far more active than others. Why? There's a subduction, there's a subducting plate fueling all of this. I mean, there was tremendous excitement in 1970 when we said, okay, we know why these cascades are there. There's a subducting wand to Fuca Plate. And I have to say that in the last 50 years, we haven't really made a lot of progress explaining why certain magma systems are coming up in certain places. It's frustrating. It feels like we should be farther along than we are with what we understand and what we don't understand about these cascades. What's the timeline from subduction to eruption? Oh, Tim, you're asking me tons of questions here. Um, I need to come up with different ways to say we don't know. Uh, je ne sais quoi. No, that doesn't, no. Uh, kid question, Liam, how often do large eruptions occur in the Cascades? Well, Liam, the largest eruption that we know of in the Cascades happened 7,700 years ago in Oregon. Right there. That was a mountain that looked like Mount Rainier and it was called Mount Mazama. But when it erupted 7,700 years ago, the whole mountain blew up. And only the stump of that mountain is still there and there's a big beautiful lake in it now called Crater Lake. The amount of material that came out of St. Helens in 1980 and the amount of material that came out of Mount Mazama 7,700 years ago is way different. 43 times the volume came out in Mazama than Mount St. Helens in 1980. And so if you want to think about something that's particularly sobering, what happens if Adams or one of these others erupts like Mazama did? That would be not a good thing. All we can do is, based on our evidence that we have with these deposits, uh, try to answer some of these questions. 
Could one or more volcanoes erupt when the magnitude 9.0 earthquake hits? It's a common question. Can't rule it out, but we have no evidence that a great earthquake, which is our uh, topic on um, Saturday, no evidence that a great earthquake offshore triggers a cascade volcanic eruption. We don't have any evidence of it yet. Uh, there may be a time that we'll, we'll, we'll make that link, and I can see your logic, but we, don't, we, we certainly don't have any experience with that in the last 100 years, and from our deposits, we don't have any evidence of that so far yet. Jeff from Vinman's Bakery, which Cascade volcano is most and le likely, least likely to erupt? Well, the safe answer is just to look at how many times St. Helens has erupted in the last 4,000 years and say St. Helens is the most likely to erupt again, even though it just did its thing in 1980. And you're like, well, I don't see how that works. The, 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 the upper 1,000 feet of the mountain's gone. Like, how can you say it's most likely to erupt again? Well, again, all we can do is base on our past and the frequency, and that's what Mullen and Crandall were doing in that report. And least likely, I mean, I guess from this you'd say Mount Jefferson. But I wonder, when I look at a beautiful chart like this, is this misleading? How many geologists have gone to Mount St. Helens and made studies? How many geologists have gone to Mount Jefferson? The same amount of geologists? The same amount of work? The same amount of looking? It could be there could be just as many volcanic deposits and just as much activity with Mount Jefferson that we just haven't found the deposits yet and done the work on. So part of this is just where you happen to visit. And that's sometimes part of what we do in geology. I knew there were going to be questions tonight. I didn't know there'd be this many. This is, I'm going to have to go along here with you. I hope you can hang in. Uh, has Mount Rainier ever had a VEI-6 or bigger eruption? I don't think so, but I don't remember what a VEI-6 really is. What limits a stratovolcano's life to 2 million years? That'll be tomorrow night. Why? That's a nice trick. Why did uh, the andesite from Goat... That's tomorrow night at 2. We're going to talk about the Goat Rocks volcano tomorrow night. Do we know what a new cone formation would look like? A new cone volcano. Well, again, tomorrow night we're going to talk about what we know about the history of making cones over the last 40 million years. And I don't want to give all that away. But the, the kind of old school way to think about these cones starting from scratch is that there's kind of the initial magmas are lava, are, are, uh, sorry, are basalt, like a shield volcano. And then as time goes on, you differentiate the magma and you start building cones made out of andesites and rhyolites. To be totally honest, I'm not sure that's still the view, but that was what I was taught 30 years ago. Where are the ash and lahar deposits from in Highway 10 and Weenass Road? Tomorrow as well, we're going to talk about reconstructing ghost volcanoes. In other words, we're going to use our deposits from tonight and investigate where cones used to be, but they're gone. And I'll give you a bunch of specific examples, including here in Ellensburg on Highway 10. Hi, Mom. Is Mount Adams dormant? I always struggle with dormant. Um, I'm sure there's, you know, you can ask Siri about it and she'll tell you what dormant means. But to, to me, um, it's a question of, is there active magma in the mountain or not? And if there's active magma in the mountain, somewhere down deep, then that thing's alive. And Adams has active magma in it. So let's get away from sleeping and dormant and extinct and all that. It's just, uh, we get hung up on words there. We've got very specific places in the Cascades that have active hot magma and it's moving and we're documenting that movement and those are the places to focus on. Is the volcanic ash particularly fertile for plant life? You know, I did a program on the Palouse here in southeastern Washington, and I thought 
that the soils over there were so rich because there was so much volcanic ash in the soils because we're downwind of the, the volcanoes. I realized that was baloney. It was almost a marketing thing. The soils in, in, in the Palouse are so great because of their grain size. And they allow to store just the right amount of water. If that soil grain size was too big, the water would drain all the way through. If it was too small, it would be clay and the water would pond. So it really wasn't a minerals in the soil because of the ash. So from that, at least in the Palouse, uh, I think the plant life thriving on volcanic ash is maybe not the way to view it, but I'm not a soils person. Does the cooling speed of the andesite affect the crystal sizes of the rock? If so, does it cool slowly or fairly fast? In general, with any lava rock that you look at, if you see minerals of different sizes, you are looking at differences in cooling rates. So this big thing here, big plagioclase, is big because there was a lot of time underground when the magma cooled. Let me give you something, let me get you something else. We looked at this one last night. In geology, we call this a porphyritic texture, meaning that the, the sparkly minerals you can see are big minerals because they formed in the dark underground, underneath the volcano. But all the, you see, there's also a bunch of black that's in between those crystals. And that black stuff, if you look carefully in a place where there's just a bunch of black and you can't see crystals and sparkles, that's a bunch of minerals that cooled very quickly because the lava came out of the volcano. I'll show you another one. Here's this 38-year-old rhyolite from a dome growing in Mount St. Helens. Same idea. You can see some individual crystals of quartz, and that is big stuff, so it cooled slowly underground, but then all the pink that you see cooled very, very quickly. So you can read the history of a cooling system uh, just by the size of the minerals. This is fun. This is fun. Uh, how long after the Juan de Fuca plate finishes subducting will the Cascade volcanoes continue to be active? Please tune in tomorrow night, Miss Koff. We're going to do that. I don't mean to be slippery here, but I guess I am. Where does all the material come from for Lahars to reach Tacoma? The mountain itself. So it's a question about Lahars. Remember, the, this is not a lava flow, this is a lahar. So do you remember I had... So the question is, where does all that liquid concrete come from? It doesn't erupt out of the mountain. It's stuff that flows away from the volcano, but it's not stuff coming out of the mountain. It's a part of the mountain. One more time. If a whole portion of the mountain breaks away and slides down into the river valley, it slowly changes from a landslide into a volcanic mud flow. And then it has enough momentum and enough water to flow. And we're back to this guy here showing Rainier in green. You can see Seattle's up at the very top. And as I push in, you can see that what we're saying is that a portion of Mount Rainier is going to break away from the mountain and that material is going to flow to your town. It's a lesson on how much we're listening to science, which we could talk about in the news today. We should not go there. Can a whole new volcano come up anywhere in Washington? No, Warren, but in the Cascades, a new volcano could pop up. We need that heat and we need a magma supply and that's tied to a subducting oceanic plate. But there's no evidence that we would, or there's no reason to believe that a volcano is gonna show up here in Ellensburg or at Ritzville or um, Warden. Any idea when Shasta last blew? 
Yeah, I, I, not off the top of my head, but for this new volcano lecture that I did, I went each cone, cone, went cone by cone, went to the USGS site, and they have dates that they know of the last major eruption of each cone. So you can go to the CVO website, Cascade Volcano Observatory website. Uh, those dates are usually in the order of 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago or maybe 500 years ago. I don't remember Shasta, sorry. Uh, Lassen erupted in 1914 and 1917 during World War I, but minor, just, you know, impressive ash clouds, but not much more than that. How about a few more? Is it possible for a new, vo uh, yes, Ron, a new volcano in the Cascade region? Possible, no evidence of new magma kind of heading to a spot now. Why does rhyolite tend to be pink? There's a mineral called potassium feldspar, and it's a pink mineral. And so magmas around the world have different chemistries. And if you're a high silica magma, you don't have many black minerals in it. You've got usually these lighter colored and pink minerals known as uh, potassium feldspar. What happens when volcanoes erupt under a glacier? Yeah, I'm really interested in that. There are... Uh, there are things like that in Washington that I haven't spent much time with. There's a place called the Indian Heaven Volcanic Field and the Simcoe Volcanic Field. This is kind of a long drive from Ellensburg, but if you go down to Goldendale and basically stay on the Washington side and, and uh, kind of north of Hood River and north of... There's cool stuff where you've got... I can't even think of the names of these things now, but you've got certain forms of cinder cones that have flat tops and other kinds of weird shapes because they were fighting the ice. And there's some modern examples uh, in glaciated places today. British Columbia has a lot of those as well. I want to say a word, but I, I don't think I have it in my head. Three more. How do scientists, Patrick, thank you. How do scientists see what's happening with the magma chambers? How do they see under the ground that far? I'm glad there are scientists like you in our world. Well, thank you, Patrick. I'm trying to be, you know, in the olden days, you would get milk delivered to your house. And this very handsome man would show up in a white milk truck and come out with a white outfit and just put the, the chilled milk bottle on your doorstep. I'm the milkman, Patrick. The scientists are doing their work. You're doing your thing, Patrick. And I'm the delivery person. But thank you. Uh, they see what's happening in a magma chamber oftentimes by looking at how earthquakes travel through that area. And so we can't go down and like take a sample of the magma chamber but we can study seismic waves, earthquake waves that travel through, kind of like a medical procedure where you want to see what's going on in somebody's brain, but you don't want to drill into the person's brain. So you send signals through to learn about the brain without hurting the brain. Same idea here. Does volcanic tuff turn into rock eventually or does it stay clumpy dirt? You know, I have a rock hammer. I have at least one left. And here's a magma chamber rock, by the way. So this is a granite. We'll talk about this more tomorrow night. But, you know, granites are pretty fun to break open. They're not super difficult to break open. This lahar that I showed you before is pretty easy to break. Let me show you. Don't want to hurt my laptop. So that was easy to break open. Volcanic tufts are the hardest rock I've had to try to break open. And a hammer this size doesn't do the trick. You need truly a sledge. And all your machismo as a 27-year-old out in southern Idaho, wailing away on these welded tufts. That's where I did my master's thesis. So they're not clumps. Those ash flows, those pyroclastic flows, they have so much heat and death when they finally run out of energy, literally, run out of gas, literally, they weld together into this absolutely brilliant and stubborn rock. 
Yeah, to ya, Bill. Thank you, man. To ya's are flat top gl subglacial volcanoes. That's what I was trying to think of. And Canadian entropy. Correct. I'm going to do one last one. I'll scroll back and see if I can find another ch children question. And uh, now that I said that, I'm sure I'm not going to find it and I'm going to feel terrible. So I'm just going to find one that I'm regardless. Um, how do cone volcanoes differ from shield volcanoes? This is how we'll finish. Some of you have seen me do this a bunch of times. So there are th three broad types of volcanoes on planet Earth. These are shield volcanoes. They're huge mountains, but they're much wider than they are tall. That's not true, actually. But they have this shape, and they're made out of basalt lava. And these were the volcanoes primarily we're talking about tonight, Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier, etc. And these are super volcanoes that are so explosive that they blow up mostly and leave a big hole in the ground. The semi-advanced thought I have for you tonight is that if you look carefully in the Cascades, you can find all three of these things. And if you take a Geology 101 class from me or most Geology 101 people, we say, this is an ocean thing, this is a coastal thing, and this is a continental thing. But of course, like most things, the more carefully you look into something, you realize it's not that simple. And I get that all the time when people are doing advanced research and then they see what I'm doing like this and they go, <laughs> it's not that simple. It's like, I know, I'm just trying to give some main messages across, getting people excited about science. Anyway, that's my own hang up. The point of is that Newberry Volcano, I think Medical Lake Volcano, maybe that other place that that person asked about tonight, shear volcanoes, why are there places where it's just pure basalt coming up a, 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 from a subducted Juan de Fuca plate? Why are these majestic cones in certain places? There's the Colshan Caldera up by Bellingham next to Mount Baker that's a true supervolcano caldera. What's going on? Why are all of those possibilities in our simple volcanic chain. So if you are looking for answers tonight and wanting predictions for it's going to be 75 years before Mount Adams erupts or something like that, we can't even explain why there are different kinds of volcanoes in this corridor and what the future will look like in 100 years or 5,000 years or 10,000 years. And I can't end it on that, because that's a downer. So I'll end it like this. A hundred years ago, we knew nothing about volcanic eruptions. We didn't know about plate tectonics. We didn't know how to monitor magmas. We didn't have people assigned as scientists to keep track of these volcanoes and spend their whole careers learning about their past behavior. And we've learned an incredible amount in the last 100 years, and especially in the last 40 to 50 years. So just think about how much more we'll know in 50 years or 100 years. Bijou's going to say goodnight. Come on. Come on. Let's go say hi to these guys. Let's go say hi to these guys. Yeah. Oh, he doesn't want to. All right. Such a tease. If you join us tomorrow night, we're going, we're staying in the Cascades. We'll retouch this stuff very, very quickly, but mostly we're gonna go in between the cones to these things that I call ghost volcanoes. Nobody else calls them that, it's my name, but I think it works. And we'll visit some very specific places in Washington. And then if you join us this weekend, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, I'll need to set up on a different part of the house where we have some sun and uh, hope we'll have some extra visitors from overseas. Here's to you and your health. Here's to the health of your parents and your grandparents and your children and your grandchildren. Here's to the health of your neighbors. Here's to the health of your mailman. 
and your milkman and your grocery clerk and your baker and your butcher and your candlestick maker. Here's to you. That was a long one. I'm glad you stuck to the end. And we'll see you tomorrow night. I love you.